Okay. Hi, everybody. Are there any questions from last week or anything we've covered so far? Okay. I would like to ask if anybody puts a note in the forums, please send me an email just to let me know that there's one there. Uh, I had had some issues earlier where it didn't look like uh, I was getting notified. And if that happens again, I need to make sure I check with the, the support people and see if there's something weird going on with Canvas. Um, okay. So uh, today we're going to be talking a lot about how Jetpack Compose works. Uh, you know, some internals, some externals, some code samples, things like that. So actually, let me find my code sample again, or my slides, which I thought I had open, but no, they were not open. Okay, and I'll hit the slide button there. And let's talk about how Jetpack Compose works and what Jetpack Compose is. Now, this is the new UE set, uh, toolkit from Google that is going to make your life so much easier compared to the old one. Now, most of you have probably not used the old version. The old version was what we call the view system. And you would define some XML that describes your user interface. Inside the code, you would load up that XML, so it actually creates all the user interface objects and then displays the user interface. And you would ask to retrieve a, uh, an object you could communicate for each thing. So you would say, hey, find this thing by an ID, find this thing by an ID. And once you have those things, you could ask them questions. You could say what text is on the screen, you could tell them to display some text, you could send some data in to display in a list and things like that. So there was a lot going on, and it was kind of separated into several places. With Jetpack Compose, it's so much simpler. The old one was what we would call an imperative way of working with your code. You give it instructions. So you'd say, hey, load up this user interface, find this component, set data in this component. And the new way is much more declarative. The idea is that you're going to be describing your user interface describing which data you're sending to it and describing which type of, of communication you get back from those. When you do this, behind the scenes, it creates a tree of all the elements representing the user interface, but it doesn't immediately draw that user interface on the screen. The tree is uh, set up based on the data you pass in, but then when it's ready to actually compose the user interface, it looks at the tree and draws on the screen what it sees. Anytime the data representing nodes in that tree changes, it would recompose. So it would just re redraw certain sections of the screen. And it doesn't have to be the entire screen. Each individual node could know which data triggers a, a, a recomposition. And that was really fantastic. You do this declaration using something we call composable functions. These are just normal Kotlin functions. They take in some data. They take in some uh, a, a, event callbacks, and you put an annotation on them, at sign composable. At compile time, the build system goes and runs a special compiler plugin that was defined for Kotlin to actually interpret these composable functions and generate a whole bunch of code behind the scenes to help them out. So it modifies these functions, passing in some extra context information, keeps track of any type of data that was consumed by that function. And then when the data changes, it triggers that recomposition. So a lot of it's very automated. So here's like a little example of what some code might look like and how maybe the tree actually is represented. The initial pass through this we call composition. So the first time that things are displayed on the screen, you're composing. Anytime parameters changes, you're recomposing. These are two sample composable functions. So we have this composable function here called family, and he takes in two lists, parent names and child names, so we can display stuff on the screen. And in order to actually display that, he says, I'm going to create a column in my user interface that contains the text of the parent names, and the child names for each child. So we're going to display the text for the parent names. In this case, we're just going to join all the parent names together separated by commas. That's what join to string does by default. And then for each child name, we're going to create a child component underneath there. Now notice that child is another composable function. So that's going to be it represent a node in that tree, which might have some other children inside of it. So uh, what we're going to do inside here is this column has the text and then all the children names. The child is going to take a name, 
and he's going to create a row to represent that child on the screen. So these are going to be side by side horizontally components. We have two pieces of text, the text with the word child colon and the text with the actual name of the child. Now, if we take a look at how this gets composed into a, a, a tree to represent our user interface, at the top level, we have this family function. So there's a node representing family. It might be a, There might be a little bit of a difference here behind the scenes, but this is the easiest way to think of it. And they map pretty much one to one. So we have our family at the top. Family is going to bring in a column. The column is going to have inside of it the text for the parent and then a child node for each child, however, depending on how many children are in the list. Each of those child children has a row that we've defined here, and the row has two pieces of text. So this is what it would look like behind the scenes representing this tree. Then when it's ready to actually draw it, it cycles through this tree to display all the stuff on the screen. The data past each of these functions, like the parent names and child names and the name here, whenever that changes, Compose is going to generate a new version of the tree. It's going to update certain parts of this and see what's actually changed. And it'll only update the things that have actually changed. So pretty cool stuff. Your composable functions are declaring a part of the UE. So when you take a look at that, that previous slide here, think of these as declarations. I'm declaring what a family is. I'm declaring it has a column, text, and child nodes inside of it. That's basically a declaration there. So at the point that these are actually run, it's not really putting something on the screen. It's just defining that tree. Keep that in mind. One of the things that is a really nice characteristic of Compose is if you do things right, and I'm going to talk about what that means in a little bit, you can it can, behind the scenes, execute any of the children in any order it wants. And it could actually do parts of it in parallel to really speed things up. And they're working on different optimizations to do this. So it's really important that you don't assume the order that anything is actually executed. So if, again, if we look on that previous slide here, there's no assumption between when this text and when this child is actually displayed on the screen. So don't assume that we're going to display the text and then display the child. And the reason we say that is because if you assume that order, you may do something in the text that actually, let's say that you own text. You may do something there that assumes the order and sets up some data that something later on consumes. And you really, really don't want to do that. You want to make these all very independent so that we define our tree here and the order in which things get composed on the screen makes no difference. Each of those composable functions should not have any side effects. And I should actually qualify a little bit. They shouldn't have any controlled side effects. We're going to talk about controlled side effects later on. Probably not today, but another session. Um, the idea here is you have a unidirectional data flow, otherwise known as a UDF. And you pass data in, and that data coming in ideally is going to be immutable. And you pass in some callbacks that whenever something changes, let's say the user clicks on something or the user starts typing something, those just call the callbacks to send the data out. So you have data in, callbacks returning data coming out. Inside of them, you should not be modifying data directly. You know, for example, if I defined a mutable person object, so be a person who has a bunch of variable properties inside of him that you could change, you don't want to pass that into a function because the function could say, oh, I'm just going to change the person's name. And the problem there is that he's not going to have any way of knowing the person's name has changed. So anybody else who's using that person can't automatically update. So you want to make sure that you're passing the data up to some point of truth. It'll be modified up there in a way that everything below can actually understand and react to. This unidirectional data flow, again, data in, callbacks out, might look something kind of like this. If I have like a, a composable function here called sample. This guy has some data coming in. So input is an int, input two is a string, input three is some object. So this is the data coming in there. And the data coming in for int and string, those are already immutable. When you pass in an integer or pass in a string to a Kotlin function, they can't be changed inside the, inside the, the function at all. Now, some object, we're going to have to look a little closer to say, is it mutable? Is it immutable? Because he could have some variable property fields inside of him. And we don't want to allow that. We want the data to just be immutable. And I'll talk about the difference between immutable and stable in a moment. These three here, on input one change, on input two change, on input three change, are the callbacks that we're talking about. 
these are representing events that happen inside of the function. So if the user you know, changes what that integer is in some field, or changes what the string is in a different field, or changes something that'll cause the object to update, it'll call these functions. So it's not actually managing the data inside of here, it's letting the caller manage the data. Immutable and stable are some annotations that can help Jetpack Compose do some of its optimization and guarantees. Anything that's immutable, if you mark it as at immutable, the assumption is that first of all, it only contains primitive types and strings or other things that are immutable. Now there, is, there are some ways that Compose can infer immutability when it looks at things, but it's much better to be as explicit with it as possible because there are cases where it can't quite determine if something's going to be immutable or not. So if you have everything from the top layer marked as immutable and all the types going down inside are immutable, then you're going to be all you're going to be all set there. Um, the idea with an immutable type is that everything inside of it, as deeply as you can possibly traverse, is going to be immutable. So if at the top level you had a family object and the family object pointed to some people objects to represent the parents and the, each of the parents represented pointed to a set of children all the way down, no matter how far you can progress in this tree, each of those objects should be immutable. Now there is another way to approach this, and preferably you go with immutable as much as possible, but there is another approach where you can create what's called a stable object. And a stable object is one that whenever somebody modifies something, it can report to Jetpack Compose that something's changed. Um, once again, it, it, the stable uh, works fairly similar to immutable in that everything has to be deeply stable or immutable underneath there. It's fine to have immutables underneath the stable. You can't go the other way around having stables underneath immutable. Um, to make something stable, first of all, equals always is going to return the same result for the same two instances that you're comparing. So if you had a Scott object and a Steve object and you wanted to compare them, they should always return false if you're considering them not to be the same thing. If I had a, a, an object that had Scott in it and a different object that had Scott in it and all the data is the same, then they should always return true whenever you compare them. Anytime there's a public property change, so if that person had a public name, we would want to make sure that that can notify Jetpack Compose the name has changed. And the most common way you do that is use something called immutable state to represent that property. And that gives it basically a little container that can be listened to by Jetpack Compose because mutable state is owned by Compose. And Compose basically has two pieces to it, the Compose runtime and the Compose user interface. Mutable state falls into the runtime side of things. And the runtime side of things is not a user interface component. It's just a set of code and compilers and techniques for generating that tree. Compose UE is the one that actually displays a user interface on the screen. And right now they just happen to be delivered in the same component. Uh, at some point they might be separated out. I mean, I'm hoping that they do separate it out at some point because it'd be great to use these completely independently, the, the Compose runtime and not have to think about it as, oh, there's UE stuff in here. Because uh, when people tend to, to uh, use a dependency here and they, they bring in Compose, they assume it's for user interface. And that tends to lead their architecture, des architecture decisions. When, uh, if all you're using is just the runtime stuff, it's really not assuming any user interface stuff. It's just creating a tree behind the scenes and managing a tree very nicely. Um, now, if all of the parameters to a composable function are stable or immutable, then Compose can skip recomposition if it doesn't detect any changes. If there's a parameter coming in that it's not stable or not immutable, Compose can't make any assumption and has to recompose every single time it possibly can. So anytime anything changes anywhere, it, can, it has to say, okay, this might be changeable. I don't know how to in infer the data about it. Here's an example of some immutables. So if we start at the top here, here's some other immutable object that I'm just going to mark as immutable to tell Compose this thing is not going to change. Maybe I have an immutable object here that's immutable. You'll notice inside here I have an int and a string property. And then I also refer to some other immutable object, which is perfectly fine because I have an immutable that's deeply immutable. No matter how far down I go, 
it's immutable. And we're going to assume that some other immutable object here also conforms to the immutable interface here, or immutable annotation, and doesn't have any type of mutable data inside of it. So if I take this object and I pass it into this sample composable, where it says input three is an immutable object, Compose can actually optimize this away. If it says that, okay, the input one, input two, input three haven't changed, I don't need to do anything. I don't need to recompose that specific uh, part of my user interface. Now stable, here's a little example of what that might look like. Maybe I create an object and I mark it as stable. I can include him from another stable object like this. So we'll see that this first one here, this integer, again, he's just immutable, which is perfectly fine to have inside a stable object. The second guy, I'm defining a mutable state object by saying mutable state of quote, quote. Now with Kotlin, he's going to take a look at that and say, well, quote, quote is a string. Therefore, I'm creating a mutable state holding a string. And that's what, th that's what thing two is going to be defined as. Thing three, I'm creating an explicit specification of what I want for that mutable state. I'm going to have a mutable state of some other stable object nullable. So I can either have a some other stable object or I can have a null inside there. And I'm just going to initialize it to null right there. By having this type of definition, it's all stable. And behind the scenes, these mutable states are kept track of in something called a snapshot. And I'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. And anytime you call a get on those, you want to get to fetch the data, the snapshot is going to note who called that, who asked for that, which composable function was trying to get it. And because of that, anytime it changes, we can go back to each of those composable functions and say, which node did you update? Or which node did you create? Let me go ahead and update that node. Pretty cool stuff. So here's an example of passing that stable object in. I could pass him in there, maybe get him back out as part of a change notification. So state is something that can be observed by Compose uh, and you know tell it what to do. You know, tell it that something has changed. And what you really want to try to do is push anything that's mutable as far up the call chain as you possibly can, preferably at the very top, maybe managing it inside your view model. And what that lets you do is not have to worry about who's keeping track of things. Now, sometimes you might have some local state. You know, maybe you want to keep track of the actual display of a checkbox being mutable state. But most of the time you want to push it all the way up so that that's actually data that's tracked in your model to say, hey, is something checked or not? So here might be a little example of a button that we're going to call counting button. It's going to keep track of how many times he's clicked. And this first example is not quite as nice an example. So we'll see here that we have a counting button. It passes in num clicks, which is a state object being passed in. So inside he knows that it's a state. And he has an on click lambda being passed in to say what to do when it's clicked. So I'm just using that in this button setup here, where I say when the button's clicked, call on click. And inside here, the text is going to say, I'm going to take a look at num clicks and get its value to display it. In the caller, I actually create that mutable state object, and I actually pass the mutable state object in as num clicks. Whenever it's clicked, I'm going to update that value. And by doing that update there, because counting button had taken a look at that state and actually got the value, he'll be refreshed. He'll be re recomposed. Now, a little better way of doing this is to take advantage of property delegation in Kotlin, which is a little bit more of an advanced concept. But the idea is here, if we take a look down where it says in the caller here, and we have by mutable state of zero, anytime you see by, that's Kotlin doing some kind of delegation. And what this means, if you have a property by some other object, this object that mutable state of zero is defining actually contains the logic to get a value and to set a value. And whenever you're delegating a property that says anytime I want to get num clicks, I'm going to delegate that to this object over here. So this object is basically a bucket that has a value. If I call get num clicks, it's going to go to the bucket and get the value out. Behind the scenes, it's also going to mark in the snapshot that this composable function, uh, well, actually, whatever the composable function is calling uh, counting button to, is reading it. Whenever we set it, so if I say num clicks two equals something, or down here num clicks two plus plus, it's going to delegate that set to this mutable state object, who's going to update the data in the bucket, 
And then also behind the scenes, take a look and see, oh, well, who used that? Which, uh, which um, component, sorry, which composable function read that before? I'm going to have to have it update its node on the screen. So this is a little more preferred. If you're using mutable state, you generally want to use property delegation. It really makes things so much cleaner. Uh, you don't have to worry about this dot value anywhere here. You just treat it as though you're talking to numclicks directly. Now, when we're keeping track of this state in a composable function, you can create some state locally. And the thing you want to be careful of here is you don't want to do anything expensive because uh, these composable functions can be called very, very frequently. And you know, it could be like every single frame that you're displaying something on the screen, it's going to call these guys again and again and again, which could be many, many times a second. And if you do a lot of work in here, if you recompute values that really don't need to be recomputed, it's going to take up some time and you're potentially going to create some jank. It's going to set it up so the user interface maybe stutters a little bit or doesn't react to user interactions quite as nicely. So if the user is scrolling, for example, as they're scrolling, it might pause for a little bit while they're scrolling. And so you get kind of a stuttery effect. Really not ideal. So one of the things we do here is we could use remember. And what remember does is he creates a node in the tree to hold on to a value. So in this first case here, num clicks. If I say by remember mutable state of, so mutable state of is a bucket that's going to hold on to some values. And by putting that in remember, we're holding on to that mutable state inside of that tree. So we don't have to keep recreating that object over and over again. Recreating objects is very expensive not quite as much on the recreate side, but on the garbage collection side. Anything that you create, if you you know, if I just kept creating a new object every single time I came in here, eventually I'm gonna have to garbage collect those. And that garbage collection can really wreak havoc on the user experience because it, it can cause your app to slow down a good bit. So by doing this, remember we put this bucket inside the tree, and then anytime we talk to num clicks, because we're using by, it's gonna delegate to that bucket. So remember creates an object. Mutable state creates an object, so it's actually going to kind of delegate straight through to that mutable state of object. Now this guy here, we're adding in a parameter to remember. And this parameter is super, super useful. This is saying anytime this parameter changes, then I'm going to recompute what the lambda does here. If the parameter hasn't changed, I just keep reusing the same object. So in this particular case, if I keep passing in the same value for number of times, we're going to keep reusing the string that's created over here. So let's say we start off and number of times is three. We come in here, he's going to run this lambda, he's going to take this string and concatenate it so that there's three of them in a row, so it'll be times, 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 and then hold on to that in this remember bucket. Note that we're using equals here. We're just computing it and using the value. We're not delegating through because there's no bucket here. So what that does is the next time if we keep passing in a three, we're just going to keep reusing that same piece of data times, times, times that was held inside the tree. If it changes to four, then when we get to this point, we're going to say, oh, hey, the, the value of number of times has changed. I'm going to have to recompute this. So it just recomputes it. And if the next several times are also four, it's not going to have to keep recomputing that value. So that's going to help speed you up quite a bit here. And we'll see down here, this is just telling us how many times we're clicking on things with this time string. One thing you want to be careful about is if you need to keep track of things across configuration changes. And if you remember from last week, we talked about configuration changes as being any time the user does something that changes the overall configuration of the device. So it could be changing a language, could be changing a time zone, could be rotating the device, it could be uh, going to side by side or split screen views inside Android that's going to resize what the screen is. Those all cause a configuration change. And what you'll need to do for internal state, if you want something to be remembered across device rotation, for an example, and that's the easiest way to test this is just rotate your device, um, then you're going to want to use remember savable instead of remember. And what that'll do is that'll store any of the values that it can store uh, across those configuration changes. In order for that to work, that would mean that what the save the remember was doing would have to be holding onto a primitive something that implements parsable or serializable, or an array of any of the, the previous things there. 
any other type of state, if you want to remember it, you got to store it in the view model. So if you're not making it parcelable or serializable or it's not a primitive, you really don't have a choice but to put it in the view model if you want it to survive that configuration change. You know, or if it's data you can put in a database, put it in a database, and then you'd have to reread it when the, the configuration change is done. So the next time the activity is created, it will read it from the database there. To make your, your, your stuff work here and work well inside your application, try to keep internal state inside of your composable functions as minimal as possible. Most of the time you want to push that as far up as you can, possibly into the view model if you care about it uh, you know, lasting across configuration changes. Um, the internal stuff, maybe if there's an internal computation that you have to run that's completely local, you know, kind of like that creating times, times, times string. Having that local, something that doesn't change very often, that's a good spot to use a remember. Um, or state that only matters at that level. So if you only care about the scroll position inside of a function, you know, maybe you have several things that scroll on your screen at once. Um, each of those would have a more localized scroll position. Now, typically when I've done scroll position recently, I typically push that up into the view model. Uh, because that's something I want to survive configuration change. Um, but you could put that in a remember savable as well uh, if you don't need that information up at the view model level. Um, make sure you pass all of your needed state that you need to the composable. Never, ever, ever use nested composable functions because that gives them visibility to the data in the outer composable. And you can get into some weird situations where the nested guy actually either modifies or does something else with the nested data, and he doesn't know that he needs to update. So you have to be very, very careful about that. Um, generally, you want to make your composable functions all top-level functions. Don't have them inside a class, don't have them anywhere else. If you make them top-level functions, it forces you to push all the data you need inside of them. Um, now, uh, if you need to talk to your view model, which you typically do, only do it at one spot. So have your top level composable, kind of like what I described last week where I defined that UE function. Uh, the top level composable is going to take the view model as an argument. And then he can pull the data out that he needs and pass it to the called functions. Okay. Um, if you're ending up with lots and lots and lots and lots of parameters, which is pretty common, you know, when you're doing this, because you know, you're going to basically need to take all your data that you need to pass all the way down the tree. If you have lots and lots of those, think about creating some parameter objects. There's actually a design pattern called parameter object. And the idea here is that instead of, if you have like maybe four or five common uh, pieces of data and callbacks that are all related just for a specific low level function. For example, let's say you have a low level function that's going to put a dialogue on the screen to say, what do you want to add to your list? Maybe you just need some information inside of there, like what are my possibilities to add to the list, what the user's currently selected, if that list is displayed or not, or if the dialogue's displayed or not. Uh, maybe all that data is very related and only used down there. Think about creating an object, maybe called add dialogue parameters or something like that. And then you can pass that down. It just makes it a little bit easier to, to, to move it around throughout your hierarchy. And you can nest those as well. But again, make sure that you're trying your best to do immutable data there. Worst case, stable data. Now there's two kinds of uh, mutable data that you might want to be exposing from your view model. Uh, as we saw last week, Room can expose things as a flow. And flow is a pure Kotlin coroutine co construct. It doesn't have anything to do with Jetpack Compose behind the scenes. The nice thing about using something like a flow is that you can share it with many collectors if you use a, a shared flow, for example, um, and you can apply chaining and transformation operations on them. So similar to what you might do with a list in Kotlin, where you could have a list, run it through a filter, map it to some different data, you can do that with the, the, the uh, Kotlin flow as well. Um, so that might be one reason to use a, a flow there. Um, state is something that belongs to the Compose runtime. And once again, keep in mind that Compose runtime is just for building the trees and managing the trees. It doesn't actually define how to do the user interface. Compose UE are the specific functions for give me a button, give me a row, give me a column, things like that. And realizing that tree 
based on the platform that you're on. Um, any type of um, modifications you want to make to these, you should set up functions inside the view model. I had to think for a second there because I couldn't remember what that bullet was for. Um, instead of having something mutable inside the view model and passing that mutable thing down to your user interface, make it be immutable and provide a function lambda that's passed down into the nested functions. The, function, the nested functions can call that function lambda, which eventually will call some kind of a modification function inside the view model. To try to make a little bit of a decision between flows and composed state, a couple things you want to ask yourself. I mean, are you going to be using the view model for a non-composed user interface? And most of the time I find myself saying no to this because usually the view model is pretty specific toward what you're going to be displaying on, on a specific user interface. Um, so if you do have something that you think the view model can really be reusable, but think about that carefully, then you probably just want to stick with flows. So I mean, if you had like a command line interface that was going to use the same view model as your composed user interface, you're probably going to want to just stick with flows and not have any composed state in there. If, however, it's really just related to this specific UE, there really isn't a problem for using state. And you can kind of make some decisions at that point based on, you know, am I using a backend like Room that's giving me flows? If so, it makes sense to use the flows, and you can expose those as state into the, uh, um, the user interface. Do you need some kind of chaining or transforms? Um, one thing we'll see a little later is that maybe you want to use data transfer objects so that uh, if you're getting mutable data out of the database, maybe you don't want to expose mutable data down to the, to the client. It's probably not a good idea. If you can make the data immutable by running some transforms on it, that would be a good reason to use a flow. Um, if you want to have multiple collectors, so if you have multiple uh, different areas in your user interface or in other parts of your application that all want to listen to the same flow, making it a shared flow as opposed to a state flow, and in this case, state flow is still a, a, com a coroutine object, you might want to stick with a flow in that case. But one thing you want to be really careful about, make sure that you're only exposing your flows as flow as opposed to mutable flow to your user interface. You don't ever want your user interface to be able to emit things to your data. Um, on the state side, if your data is managed directly by the view model and you want to use, uh, it's, it, the state there, is, it's useful if the data is managed directly by the view model because it's just simpler to write. Um, you also should make it as a, make sure it has a private setter. We'll see this, uh, what that looks like on the next slide, I think. So here's an example of setting up a flow inside a view model. So let's say that we're getting a movie's flow out of the database. This is going to return a flow movie. The movie's flow itself is going to be read only coming from the database, but the movie object is read write. So this is not ideal, but and this is exactly what we did in the first example there, but it's a slightly simpler way to do it. We'll talk about some more complex ways to make things completely immutable later on. Um, now, if we want to keep track of a selected movie, if we want to use a flow for this, you'd have to set up some code that looks kind of like this. And really what you want to do is set up two separate properties. The first property is the mutable flow that you're going to emit to inside the view model. And since this is only going to be touched inside the view model, you want to make sure that it's private. So we're defining here private val underscore selected movie flow. And this is the typical convention we use for this, is throw an underscore on stuff that is private to the view model when you have a pair of properties representing the same thing. So the selected movie flow is going to be a mutable state flow. That means there's going to be one instance held on to at a time. People are going to see whatever the latest instance is. So if this thing gets sent to a pretty fast, the collector might only see the last, version, last thing in there. So I'm starting off with mutable state flow for a movie and making it be null because I had, it's a nullable movie. So that's the mutable one. It's private. I expose it by creating selected movie flow and declare it as just being a flow of movie. So it's a read only flow. It's collectible only. You can't emit to it. And then I'm going to set up my getter to just return that first property. 
Now by using a getter here, that sets it up so we don't have a separate backing field. I could have said val selected movie flow colon flow equals underscore selected movie flow. But keep in mind, that's actually going to create a new backing field, which is just a pointer to that first property, the selected movie flow. In this case, I'm omitting that, or oh, oh sorry, omitting that, uh, um, uh, that extra backing field there. So this guy here, anytime we ask for selected movie flow, we end up just getting the underscore selected movie flow. But the caller sees it just as a read-only guy. Uh, one thing I should mention on this, in both of these cases, the caller has to set up code to collect this. So it's not quite as clean as just using a, uh, um, a, a state from Jetpack Compose. So for this first one here, well, both of these, the caller inside Jetpack Compose would say viewmodel.moviesflow.collectAsState, and then has some code to say what to do anytime the value changes. In this example here with flows, I'm doing a little bit more here. I'm actually going to change the data coming through here. So let's say, for example, I defined a movie data transfer object. And the idea behind this is to set it up so the user interface only sees read-only data. It doesn't see data it can modify. By passing that list of movie to the user interface, he could actually take a look at one of those movies and change its fields because the fields were variable. Here we're defining this data transfer object and everything is just mutable, or sorry, immutable. And then inside here, I need to map it. So val movies flow equals movie repository movies flow was our basic way of getting the data from the repository. But then I'm adding in some functionality on here to map it. And map is a function in Kotlin that takes a list or some other collection and then converts each of the items in that list. So in this case, the first level here is any time I get a new entry in the movies flow. I'm going to take that whole entry, which is the list of movies, and change it into something else. So that's this top level map. I get my movies, movies list, and I'm going to change it into another list. Now the changing another list here, I'm going to run through map again to look at that list and change each movie into a DTO. So top level, I'm changing the entire list to a list of DTOs. Then I walk through each item and each of those items, the movies, I'm just going to map into a movie DTO. So see here I say, get the ID, the title, and description from the movie, and use them in the movie DTO. So the end result of this is whoever's listening to this movie's flow is going to get a list of movie DTOs rather than a list of movies. Now if we're using state instead, and this is a Jetpack Compose runtime construct here, it's much easier to set up. And this is one thing I really like about this. If you really don't have to reuse this movie view model in a non-composed context, personally, I think this is a better way to go about it. It's so much simpler on both ends, both inside the, the view model and in the user interface itself. So what we do here is I'm going to say var screen by mutable state of nullable screen, passing in the main screen. So I'm just going to start off as the main screen. Um, so this, again, the mutable state of, is going to create a bucket to hold the current value. The by is going to delegate, so anytime I ask for the screen, I get the value from the bucket. By saying private set, the only thing that can change that screen is this view model. So we've made it immutable outside. So if, you know, if I'm using these mutable states, I don't have to have two separate properties like I did before. And I don't need to collect it on the user interface side. So on the user interface, I can just pass in viewmodel.screen to whatever composable functions I want. And because the getter on that screen is delegating to this mutable state object, it automatically tracks that in the, the current snapshot to say, here's a set of data that I've got. Who called it? Keep track of what function called it which node was created inside the tree based on that, and any time the value changes, I need to re recompose that node in the tree. Now there's a couple little gotchas along the way here. One thing to watch out for is the list class, or list interface, I should say. Um, Compose can only figure things out about things that it actually compiles. 
So if you throw in another class that's already been built from a third-party library, Compose doesn't know anything about it. It doesn't know if it's immutable. It doesn't know if it's mutable. It doesn't know if it's stable. And it can't infer any of that data. So what we need to do, I mean, there's actually the other case where, you know, you could have the list itself isn't changing, but maybe each of the items are mutable. So if we throw some helpers in here, we can actually assist Compose in optimizing what it's doing. And the easiest way to do this is to create a really simple wrapper. And the code for this is going to look kind of weird, but I'll walk through what this is saying. The idea is we're going to wrap up our real list inside something called an immutable list just to throw this at immutable on it. And you should only ever use this when you're creating a list of things that themselves are immutable. So inside here, I'm defining a mutable list with, of some type. So the elements in there are going to be of some type. And I'm going to pass in the real list that I want to wrap. So this is a list I might have gotten it out of room. I might have gotten it, uh, you know, maybe I just created it using list of inside uh, Kotlin. But I'm going to pass that guy in. And immutable list is going to implement list T. So I'm basically just saying that what I've got here does everything that a list should do. But I'm further throwing in this delegation on the end, saying I'm going to implement list T, delegating all the function of list T to list. So really what this is going to do is I pass that list in, and then the immutable list, anything you ask list-wise, is just going to be delegated directly to the list that we're wrapping. And that seems kind of silly. Um, it's really super useful if you override some functions. Um, if you were doing a decorator pattern, this would be a really common way to do a decorator, but you'd have some functions inside here that you override. In this case, the only reason we're doing this is to throw this at sign immutable on here. And that allows Jetpack Compose to know, okay, I can assume that this list will never change. And if I just do an equals on it compared to an old value, I should be able to actually detect if there's been a change to this. Um, to wrap it, Let's say that we had a movie list we got from somewhere. So here's movie lists, a list of movies, and it was returned from a database or something. By wrapping it, by saying immutable list wrapped around the movie list, I now have an immutable list that I can pass to a composable function, and it'll be able to know what to do with it. So here's a little bit more complex example of using this. So let's say that we were using that same DTO setup that we did before, where we want to convert our list of movies into a list of movie DTOs. Because we know movie DTO is immutable, we can go further and wrap it in an immutable list here. So this top level map is saying, take that list of movies, so whatever the current list of movies is, I want to convert it to an immutable list, movie DTO, so I get the advantage of that immutable tag. So I'm going to wrap my conversion that I'm setting up inside here. So the conversion inside here says, take the contents of that list, each of the items, convert it to a movie DTO. So this block inside here, the result of it is going to be a list of movie DTOs. I wrap it in a mutable list, and boom. Whoever is, is uh, collecting this movie's flow will see an immutable list of movie DTOs. Neat stuff. Now, there's a bunch of great articles out there talking about doing debugging, and I've only scratched the surface on some of this. There's a whole bunch of things you can do to try to figure out what you need to do to optimize. But the very, very first thing uh, that I want to mention is down here at the bottom, why you should always test Compose performance and release. Um, running in Compose with debug mode can be sluggish. So if you're debugging your application and just running it normally through Android Studio, if it's a little sluggish, don't worry about it too much. What you really want to do is once in a while, test it in release mode. And by testing in release mode, it strips out all the garbage behind the scenes that are needed to help you debug Jetpack Compose, and you should see much better performance. Um, if you still see some bad performance here. Whoops. If you still see some bad performance here for um, uh, release mode, then you want to start looking about why. And the most common things why is that Compose is having to do too much work. 
And that would be if you passed in just a normal list instead of an immutable list, for example, like that, uh, where it can't make any assumptions, it can't optimize, it just has to completely redraw everything every time. That's the number one thing that's going to cause you some issues. Uh, so these other articles in here will give you some ideas of things you can do to help optimize and debug your application. Okay, so let's hop out of there. Any questions? <clears throat> okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at our room example. And what I want to try to do is start creating a better user interface out of this. Uh, right now we had a super, super simple interface for our, our database example. And that was fine just for a quick example. But we want to set it up so that you can actually go in and edit things and change some data and uh, you know make the application actually do something for real. Um, so this week we're going to focus on, we're going to use the same type of lists that we did before, which is just you know, really you know kind of dead simple list. But we're going to add in some edit screens and clean some things up and things like that. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to take the code that we developed last week, and I'm going to create a new project and copy the code over. It's generally really, really hard to just make a copy of the project and do some renames inside Android Studio. So what I strongly recommend you do when you're doing this is make a new project and just copy the code over that you need. Copy over the parts of the build scripts that you need. So let's go ahead and do that. <clears throat> I'm going to come up here and say File, New, New Project. This is going to be a Compose activity. And let's call this Movies 1. And I'm going to say Finish. Bring that guy over there. And I'm going to actually, whoops, shoot. Let's see if I can shrink that a little bit. I was accidentally dragging the uh, border of the displayed area on the screen, which is not good. Let's see if I can bring this one over a little bit. So you can kind of see what I'm doing. And so here's our room example. Here's our new application. I'm going to switch that over to the project view. And I've got my app, source, main, Java, movies one. Over here, I've got my room example. Let's go ahead and first of all, copy our data stuff over. So I'm going to grab this data directory here. I'm going to control C to copy it and control V to paste it. Just copying that data directory. Notice that in Android Studio, when you copy this, it's just going to grab the directory name of the lowest thing. So be careful about that, because sometimes you might want to be trying to grab this entire com Java dude, blah, blah, blah. It'll only actually grab that lowest level folder that represents that. Um, I'm not too keen on that. I'm pretty sure there's no way to change that. So sometimes you have to create some top level uh, directories by hand. In this case, I'm just copying the data directory from there to this com Java dude movies. Now, when you do that, depending on how you did it, sometimes the uh, the name will be changed. So if you did like a refactor, for example, it'll change the package name. But in this case, you'll see that it actually says package com Java dude room example, which is room example data, which isn't right. So I need to fix that. I'm going to click on it and hit Alt Enter, and then say change files package to com Java dude movies one data. Boom, and there we go. So that changes it. Um, let's take a look at the other things. So we're going to have actor. I'll do the same thing. Movie. I'll do the same thing. Movie DAO. Movie database. Rating. And I believe roll was already done. Roll was the one we just did. Yep, he's good there. So that helps out a lot there. Now, most of the errors here you're going to see look like room things. So I need to fix my build scripts to have that information. So a few things I want to do with the build scripts. Let me go to the very top level first. I'm going to change this to 111 for Jetpack Compose. I'm going to change my uh, Kotlin version to 1610. And then let's go into the build.gradle underneath the app. 
and we've got our target SDK and min, and, uh, min SDK and compile SDK set properly. These guys are going to need to get updated. So I'm going to, first of all, the ones that are, let me close him down. The ones that are not composed ones, I'm going to hit Alt Enter on. Whoops. And change them. And I think these are all composed version ones. Yep. And then I need to bring in room. So I'm going to go back over to this guy and take a look at his dependencies. And grab the room stuff up here. Paste that in. But I also need to make sure I'm bringing in the Kotlin symbol processor plugin. So if I go back over to this guy, uh, well, first of all, let's grab him from here. So we have the com Google Dev Tools KSP. I'm going to copy him, put him back up at the top of this guy. And now I need to define what version we want, and that's in the top level build.gradle. So I come back to the top level build.gradle here, and the top level build.gradle in the old one. And we'll see here that I had this com Google Dev Tools KSP. I'm going to go ahead and copy him. and paste them into that plugins block in the top level. And I think we should be good to go ahead and sync it. So I'm going to hit sync over here. Anytime I say the word sync, I think of this commercial where somebody's like, it's a boat with an SOS and they're saying, SOS, we're sinking, we're sinking. And then there's a guy in a different boat who hears that and he's like, what are you sinking about? And it's like, I can't remember what the commercial was for, but it was it was a great little uh, interaction that they had there. Okay, so now I've got the hymn copied over. <clears throat> Let's take a look at what else I have inside of here. I had a common guy, a movie database repository, a movie repository, a movie view model. Let me go ahead and copy all those guys and paste them into my base project here, or base package. And then we can take a look again. I'm going to have to fix the packages on these. Kind of like that. And I think we should be in pretty good shape. Oh, these guys actually are going to be importing the wrong stuff now. So if I look at these imports, We'll see that they have room example for all those. <clears throat> so what we can do, I usually like to just go ahead and delete the old imports, and then I can just re-import these by hitting control space and pulling the right ones. This is one of those places I miss Eclipse because when you, uh, if you did a control shift O to organize imports, it would automatically go through and pull in all the right imports for us instead of having to go to each one of these. Okay, so there's those. Then we can go, that was the view model. Let's go to the repository one. I'll do the same kind of thing. I'm just going to delete those guys. And then I can bring in the rating, the movie, the actor. And the rating with movies, movie with roles, actor with roles. That's good. Go up to the next one here. I'm going to kill those bad imports. And we'll take a look in here, bring in the movie database, bring in the rating, bring in the movie with roles, bring in the actor, bring in the actor with roles. So far, so good. And then let's look at common. See, he looks like he's okay. It's just that common functionality there. <clears throat> and I think that is pretty much it. Let's try running this and see what happens. So he's again starting up the emulator while it's actually building. There's our lovely little emulator.
<coughs> so the build finish is just waiting for the emulator to be ready. Now it's installing it, and boom, we have a little application. Note that it says hello Android because I didn't bring over the changes into our main activity. Let's go ahead and do that. I missed that one. I'm going to come into the main activity here. I think I'm just going to go ahead and copy the main activity as is. That should be okay. And let's just to rename the, the package on him. Paste him, and I will say overwrite. Oh, it did not want to do that, even though I just said overwrite. So let's copy the code in there. Control A, copy, Control A, paste. There we go. And then let's fix the imports in here. And bring in the movie view model. Whoops. Uh, this example theme is actually changed. So underneath UE theme, we actually called it Movies one theme, so I'm going to copy that and change him. And let's see what else we have inside here that it doesn't like. I should be able to just go ahead and pull this over there. There we go. And now I'm going to pull in my main screen. Whoops. Are those still... What is he unhappy about there? Oh, so what's going on here when I'm trying to import these? Because I named these the same, which probably wasn't a great idea, um, but because I did that main screen over here, the function is visible inside this file. The main screen that I want is in a different package. And so what it's trying to do here is actually do a fully qualified import on each one of these ones. And I really don't want that. Um, so what I'm going to do just to kind of cheat this really quickly, I'm going to come down to main screen here and put an X after it. List screen, put an X. Rating screen, put an X. Actor screen, put an X. Movie screen, put an X. Rating screen, put an X. Movie screen, put an X. I'm basically getting these ones out of the scope. So that when I come back up here, I can just do a control space on each of these. And then it'll do an import instead of fully qualifying them. So generally a good idea, make these different names. Um, typically when I'm designing my user interface, I actually create these first and then create the functions later. So it, going in that order, I don't have a problem with it. Uh, but in cases like this, you end up with that issue. So I'm going to bring all these guys in. And then I just have to get rid of those X's. And I should be in great shape. So I'll come down here and I will say delete the X. Delete the X on each one of these guys. So you're getting to see some weird little behind the scenes tricks that I do once in a while. And now I got to bring all the data in here. So bring in movie, actors with roles. Movies with roles, actor. And you'll notice in here, I'm actually using the database entities. So these are the ones that have the uh, writable fields. Not ideal here. We really should be using data transfer objects. Uh, and what I'm going to do at some point here is a little bit of a refactor on this. So I will be modifying those to be data transfer objects, but I'm probably not going to do that in a lecture. I'll probably do that on the side and then show the result just so you can kind of see how that might go. And then that's much better from a point of view of the from, of um, immutable data being passed around. There's lots of little things like that that can make your interface much, much more effective. Okay, so now he looks good. Let's try running him again. Shouldn't take as long because the emulator is already up.
And why is he still saying hello, Android? Oh, because I've got the uh, the wrong name on this, and it's actually reusing the old one. So let me hit Alt Enter on him, change the package. Now, if I run it, we should be in better shape. There we go. So we can go see our ratings. And, oh, I didn't create my database, that's why. So I'll reset my database, take a look at the ratings. Then we can navigate there. There's PG, I don't have any PG movies. Let's go to PG-13, see our PG-13 movies. See Hobbs and Shaw, good. So now we've actually modified this to be our, our new application. Okay, um, I'm gonna try to come up with some better ways to, to copy the data over. Um, cause obviously this is, takes a little work to make this work. Um, but I've just been stung too many times by Android studio. When you try to do renames, there's usually some metadata behind the scenes that keeps the old names and it becomes very, very nasty. Um, I've actually gone to the, the you know, doing things where, uh, I'll go to I'll make a copy of the directory, then go and rename directories and then do, uh, some, uh, copy, some search and replace across the entire project. Um, this feels a little bit better because I'm not just randomly doing text changes. I'm actually seeing where things can break in the IDE. So that's usually why I go this approach. Okay, so now we have something that actually is going to present kind of a reasonable user interface here. Um, I'm gonna keep the buttons as they are for the moment for the, for the front screen. But what I'd like to do is set this up so that uh, when you go into those screens and when you get down to the point of a movie or an actor, you can actually edit the data for that movie or the actor and then drill down into you know wherever they're going from there. Um, I'm not going to, for the moment, deal with uh, deleting anything. We're gonna talk about that when we deal with lists um, or reparenting. So, I mean, if we're trying to do any things about, you know, say, well, I want to move this actor to a different movie. Um, we're not gonna do anything like that. But when we talk about lists next week, uh, we'll talk about how do you delete things and how do you add new things. For this week, we're just gonna focus on editing data. <clears throat> so let's take a look at what we can do with that. What we've got right now for screens is everything is inside this main activity. And it might be a good idea to start pulling these out into their own things because they're gonna get a little bit bigger. So let's think about our top level UE. I'm gonna go ahead and keep with the main activity, but I wanna move these other screens to things themselves. So the main screen here, let's actually hit an X on him, control X. And I'm just gonna to try to paste him up in here. Let's create a new package underneath there. Call it screens. And then I can paste it in there. And notice that that created a main screen file with just this one composable inside of it. I'm gonna need to do some imports. It really should have picked up those imports. I'm not sure why it didn't. Because usually when you copy and paste things or cut and paste things, uh, Android Studio will take any imports it also needs. So it's kind of interesting that that didn't work. I bet it would work if I actually created the file first. Let's just try that just to see what happens. So I'm gonna take this list screen over here. I'm gonna do my control X, come over here and say new file list screen and paste it. Yeah, so you see right, what happened there is it actually brought the imports over when I did that. Uh, I'm not sure why it didn't do that when I just did the paste at the package level and had it create its own file, but this is probably a better way to go here. We'll create a file first and then paste the stuff in. So take a look at the rating screen. And I'm going to go over here and say new file ratings screen and paste it. And then we'll come over here, get the actor screen, control X. Paste that. It's gonna be movies screen, control X. And rating screen for a single rating. Paste that. And let me try one other approach here. If I 
take this guy here. Can I do, actually, maybe I can just do it this way. I'm going to right click on him and say refactor, move, uh, file name, movie screen. Let's just see if that's going to work there if I do a refactor on him. Oh, he put them in the same package though. But he did bring the imports over, so that refactor was a little bit better. If I drag it up to screens, it should refactor them into there. That's a little better. Let's take that approach. So we'll do it the last one that we're going to do here. Um, so I'm just going to go to actor screen, right click, refactor, move. Let's put change the package on this one to be movies1.screens. Destination directory, we'll put it in the screens directory, and refactor. And that looks like that's a little better. Well, what did he do? Yeah, it looks like the, the best approach out of all of these is just creating the file by hand. And then, well, why is he having trouble with those? because I was picking the uh, objects and not the functions. There we go. I'm going to pick that function. There. Much, much better. So now if we go back to our main activity, he looks like he's okay. Where is he finding those? Screens, screens. So it looks like the refactor or the cut was actually modifying this file as well. Let's just try running it just to make sure that that's still working. Hopefully so. Looks good. Okay, so now what we want to do is start modeling our screens a little bit nicer here. So I'm going to want to have a title bar at the top. I'm going to want to have, uh, I guess ideally what we could do is put some buttons at the bottom to navigate to the individual lists so that uh, you have the choice of just jumping to the actors list or the movies list um, and the ratings list. But the main thing we want to focus on is being able to display and edit the data. So we could have a, a single screen that displays the, the data inside of text boxes that you can edit. Or we can have a little edit button up on the toolbar to let you go ahead and do that. And we're going to go with that latter approach. We're going to have an edit button on the toolbar as well. So let's take a look. i close down a bunch of those at some of our screens here. And what we're going to want to do is create a screen that has a toolbar at the top the nav buttons at the bottom, and possibly some actions on the toolbar. Now, because we're going to have some similar functionality in all of ours, I want to use some common functions to do this. So I want to create a helper function that's going to help us display some stuff at the top and the bottom and all that. So let's take a look underneath screens here. I'll create a new file here that we will call movie scaffold. And scaffold is a function inside of Jetpack Compose for generally describing a screen. And it's known, it's known as a slotted function, or a slotted composable function. And the idea here is that we're going to have regions on the screen that we're going to represent by composable functions that we pass into this function. So if we had a screen that looked kind of like, let's see if I can do it this way. Maybe we have something that looks kind of like this. With a title up there and then some actions. On that side, and then we have some content inside here. 
And then maybe down here, we have ratings, movies, and actors. Something kind of like that. So if we had kind of a rough idea of setting up the screen here, we're going to have some slots on the screen. So we have a top slot here for the title, slot for some actions, a slot for the content, and a slot for each of these buttons. We're not going to define it that way. We're going to use something a little different behind the scenes. But if we think about the general scaffold in Compose, he has a top section here they're going to call top app bar. Actually, I think it's just top bar is the, the parameter they use. Content, and then bottom bar. And then they also have stuff if you want to have a side navigation menu here. We're not going to use that. But take a look at what this screen looks like. So we have a general screen layout that's being managed by the scaffold function. And we pass in what we want at the top, what we want at the bottom, what we want in the center here. And he takes care of measuring things out for us. So we're going to use a Compose Scaffold, and we're going to create our own scaffold on top of it to simplify things so we have a consistent experience across all of our pages in the application. So let's define here an at composable function. I'm going to call it Movie Scaffold. There's going to be some stuff that we pass in. And then we're going to call a Jetpack Compose Scaffold. And he's going to have a top bar, content, whoops, and a bottom bar. And we're going to use our movie scaffold function to take care of defining the top bar and the bottom bar. And we're going to pass in the content for the rest of the page. So we're just basically defining a structure for our overall page here. So let's, let's pass that content in. I'm going to say content is going to be a composable function that doesn't take any parameters and returns a unit. Now it turns out when we're defining this content, scaffold passes in a padding values function here. And that is an, the an information to tell the content how much space to have above, below, and to the side of it based on what the scaffold's computed. That way, the content is going to appear exactly where it's supposed to appear with the right type of padding and everything. So it won't overlay the top bar or the bottom bar. Now, because of that, we need to pass that into the content. So I could come up here and say padding values. And then down here, just say content equals content. And it just passes it straight through. But what I like to do is I like to, to convert that into a modifier and pass the modifier to the composable. And a modifier is the thing that gives you the place to specify your padding, to specify if something's clickable, to specify height, width, size, whatever. Um, each of these are ways of modifying how that content appears on the screen. So I like to just convert that padding values into a base modifier that you can extend inside of there. So I'm going to change this to say modifier. And then here, I'm going to say content passing in modifier. Make sure it's Android X Compose UE modifier dot padding, passing in the padding values. Now remember with a lambda, if you only have exactly one parameter, you can just call it it. You don't have to specify it there. Or what you could do is come in here and say padding values and give it a name and then pass the name inside like that. So that's going to take care of our content and that could be any content we want in the base of the page. But what we'd like to do is specify top and bottom in a consistent way so that we can have uh, that functionality not have to have every single page define the same things over and over. So on our top, the first thing we're going to need is a title. So let's pass in a title here. And if we think the title is going to be dynamic, we should pass in a string here. 
And then it's up to the parent, the caller of this function, to fetch that string or define that string. But in this case, these, these um, well, no, the titles are actually going to be uh, different because it might be the movie name. So let's go ahead and pass the text in as a, the title in as a text, a string. <laughs> so inside here, I'm going to create a top app bar. I'm going to pass in title. And that's a slot inside that top app bar. So I have to define what is going to be put inside that spot on the top app bar. Here we're just going to use a text. And the text is going to be the title that was passed in, just like that. And if we want to give it a little padding, I could put a modifier on there. So I could say modifier equals padding 8.dp. So that's going to give us eight density independent pixels around the text for that title. <coughs> so that's our, our title uh, part there. Now we're also going to have some actions that we might pass in there. And this lambda generates the actions that show up on there. Now what I like to do is abstract those actions. I don't like to have the caller have to create the actual UE structure. So I want the UE structure for those actions to be consistent across all of my pages. So I like to create another object to represent logically those actions. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to define a at immutable data class top action. And the top action is going to have an icon. It's going to have some text describing that icon and then an action we're going to perform when we click it. So let's start off with the icon here. I'm going to have a val icon, which is going to be a, uh, what, was, what was the image vector, I think is what, what I'm looking for here. Yes, an image vector. Was that the right one? Let me just double check. Yes. And then I'm going to have some text representing what I'm showing on the screen. Now the text here is going to be fixed to represent this. And this is useful for any type of screen readers, uh, as well as you might set it up so that if they long press it, they could hover and, and have a little uh, icon pop up. But generally you want the content description of this to be used for screen readers. So if somebody is having trouble seeing the screen, they can use a screen reader to announce to them what this button actually is. So I'm going to say val content description ID is going to be an int. And this is going to be an integer ID into the strings.xml file. To enforce that, I'm going to throw a string res annotation on here. And if somebody tries to pass in anything other than a reference to a string in the XML file, they'll get a, uh, either a lint warning or a lint error, depending on how they have things configured. Finally, I need an action here. So I'll say on click is going to be a lambda that doesn't take any arguments and doesn't return a value. Now what I'd also like to do with that lambda is I'd like to have that, well, let's see, do I want to do that here or do I want to do it at a higher level? I have a decision point here I'm trying to make about uh, how I want to handle this in the background because I probably don't want to handle this in the foreground. So I could just pass down a function and up near the top level, they have to say, kick off a coroutine to do something. Or I could make this a suspend function, which forces it to be a coroutine. But if I do that, I'm going to have to also pass in a coroutine scope in order to be able to do anything here. Um, I think I want to do that, though, because I'm always going to want to kick these off in a, in a background. So I'm going to pass in a... Um, well, actually, that would be passed into the movie scaffold. Um, but this is the actual work that's going to get done when the button's pushed. So up here, I'm going to pass in a scope, which is a coroutine scope, so that I can actually do that uh, button click. Now let's take a look at how we can convert this into an actual icon button on the screen. We're going to declare it just like we're doing everything else. So we declared our top app bar inside there. We're going to declare an icon button. And 
and his on click is going to be actually I want to do the uh, actions I need to pass those in there top actions is going to be a immutable list of top action and we're going to define immutable lists like I did in the slide as a helper to guarantee to compose that the list is going to be immutable. So let me uh, define a little other class up in here, another file. Call it. Com oh, I do have a common already, don't I? Yes, I do. We'll go into common, and let's define that immutable list. So we're going to have immutable, and we're going to make this be a data class immutable list of some type of item. We're going to wrap a list of that item type. Immutable list is going to implement list by just passing everything through to list. So by doing that, we have something that we can guarantee to Jetpack Compose that it's going to be a list that once it's in, it's not going to change. And they can just compare two separate lists rather than having to worry about a list changing in place. So now down in here, I can say top actions for each, because we're going to want to walk through. And for every action we have, we're going to create an icon button. And let's give it a variable name here, action. This is going to be action dot on click, kind of like that. Um, now it's complaining here because that's a suspend function. So I need to actually kick off a coroutine there. Let's go ahead and break things down here a little bit so it's a little easier to work with. So I'm going to say scoop dot launch. And inside there, do my on click. So this is going to kick off some background processing running that action. And because we made this action a suspend function, the people who define these top actions don't have to worry about the threading. They can just know that what they run is going to be run off of the main thread. And down here we can actually say dispatchers dot I guess these might, these might end up uh, being uh, database stuff. So I'm just going to run the IO dispatcher. And there we go. So this is going to create our icon button, but that's just the button. That's not the icon itself. We need to define the icon inside here. I'm going to say icon. And we're going to pass in that image vector, which is going to be action dot icon. And then the content description, which will be action dot content description ID, but I need to go and look this guy up. String resource ID equals him. And let's go ahead and clean this up a little bit so we can actually see everything. And there we go. So this has defined that button to go on the top. So now you can start to see why I wanted to have a common function to do this, because I, I could have some helper functions to do this, but then everybody's going to have to call the same function. And it's not going to be fun. Um, but I'd also like to have a modifier on that icon to make sure he's got some space as well. We'll put it on the icon button. So we'll come here, say modifier equals that, and we're good. So by having a common function like this, it gives you a starting point for all of your pages, so they're all going to be consistent. Okay, any questions? Nope, on we go. So there is our top bar with our icons in it. Let's take a look at our bo bottom bar here. So our bottom bar is going to need to say which screen I want to navigate to when I click. And what I'm going to do with this is anytime you click on one of these buttons at the bottom to jump to ratings or to jump to movies or to jump to actors, I'm going to completely clear the stack. So we're going to set up some function inside of our uh, view model to replace the entire stack with whatever you clicked on. And so it gives you a new starting point. We could set it up so that when you click it, it just pushes it, but then your stack just keeps getting bigger and bigger. 
And I'd rather set it up so that, that you know, we can uh, reduce the stack every time you switch tabs. So to do this, I need to actually be able to know which possible screens I'm shifting to. And in this particular case, I'm treating all these bottom buttons exactly the same. So I need to be able to pass in a screen to use, uh, to, to switch to, and I need to know which one is the current screen. So let's pass in a screen targets, which is going to be an immutable list of screen. And when I'm passing this in, I probably want to make something to make an immutable list pretty easy to create. So if I come back to my common, I'm going to create a little helper function here that we'll call immutable list of. And we're going to just pass in a varying length argument list of screens. So we do that by saying var arg screens screen. So that's going to give us a, you know, somebody can pass in any number of screens to create this. Could be zero. And then the result of screens is going to be an array that we can interact with. So I'm going to say, make an immutable list of list of screens. Now this doesn't quite work correctly. If I take a look at the type, when I say list of here, he's going to take this screens as a single element. So he's going to make a list of arrays, and we don't want that. What we really want to do is take those screens and pass them in as separate arguments to list of. We do that by putting a star in front of that. That's called the spread operator. And the spread operator is just going to take this array and break it down into separate arguments. So now the result of list of is going to be a list of those individual elements as opposed to a list of a single element that's an array. Um, this operator is great because it removes an ambiguity that Java had. When you did stuff like this with Java, the varying length argument lists sometimes would say, oh, well, it's an array, therefore it's okay, I'll break it up. And so we do some automated stuff in certain situations, and in other situations, it uh, might not create something like that. You, know, you might pass in a list, and it'll actually use a uh, uh, the whole list as the, the varying length argument list, single item. So it's, it's kind of awkward that way. But this gives us a nice little way to say I'm going to create an immutable list by passing in a comma-separated list of screens. Okay, so down at the bottom here, so we have screen targets. Let's actually pass also in the current screen, which is going to be a screen. And that's going to let us know which one to highlight down at the bottom there. So we're going to create a nice little bottom nav bar down here. And we'll see if I can remember how to do this. I might have to look this one up, but we shall see. So I'm going to say bottom navigation. And inside there, let's see what he has. So he has, whoops, he has content and modifier. So actually, I think I just am going to do this. And then we can say screen targets for each. And inside there, bottom navigation item. Yeah, I think I'm remembering how to do this. That's great. That's one of the things with when you write these scaffolds. You, you typically do it once and sit it and reuse it over and over and over again, so you kind of forget how you did it sometimes. Um, I'm going to say that this item is selected if the screen I'm representing is the current screen. So I'm going to say screen equals equals current screen, just like that. And then that should select it, kind of highlight it there. On click, is going to request to switch screen. So what I need to do is come up here and pass in some way to switch the screen. So I'm going to say on screen select is going to be a function that takes a screen to tell it which screen the user selected and do something with it. It's not going to return me a value because I don't care. It's just going to perform some action to switch that over. And I'm also going to make that a suspend function.
Well, you know, in this case, I really don't have to because it, it's all it's going to do is, is uh, well, this is one of those cases where I have to decide, do I want to assume some knowledge about what's happening above me? Um, and in this case, this, these actions are going to be very quick. So doing them on the user interface thread of just switching a, a state shouldn't be a problem. But if there's any data changing, that's when you really want to make sure you're running something in the background. So this one, I'm going to go ahead and make it not a suspend function. But if the caller wants to do something more, they can make it a suspend function. Although, you know, it really doesn't hurt. I'm, I'm on the fence on this one. I like using suspend functions for actions, but this is a kind of a well-known action on what it's doing, and it's supposed to do something pretty quick. So yeah, I'll leave it like this. These are the arguments I have in my head while I'm programming. So what I want to do here is when we click, I want to switch. So what did I call that one? On select screen. So say on select screen, passing in the screen, just like that. So that should actually take care of it. Now I also want to have for this bottom navigation item um, an icon and a, and a description. So I take a look at this guy. We'll see that he has an icon slot inside of him. You can see it right there, this composable. And he has a label. That can go on there as well. And once again, it's also a composable slot. So there's two little slots I can fill data in. So let's fill in the data. But hmm, we don't have a name on these, do we? Let's take a look at the definition of screen. Was that in common? No. Was it in the view model? Yeah, so sealed interface screen doesn't have any information on it. So what would be nice is if these screens actually contained the data saying what the name of the screen is. So let's do this. Let's make this be, instead of a sealed interface, I'm going to call it a sealed class. And I'm going to pass in a string res for the... Uh, title ID for the screen. Kind of like that. And now for each one of these, I need to pass in a string res representing that screen. So we're going to put these all into our strings.xml if I don't have them ready. Yep, I hadn't defined these yet. So I'm just going to paste those there so I know which ones I need to do. And I'm going to create some strings here. So I'm going to say screen title main and let's just say movie mania I'm just making this up as I go uh, and oops, how many more do I have one two three four five six and we can say ratings movies movie actually that would be actors rating movie and actor now once we get down to these guys the rating the movie and the actor we're not going to be using the information from the screen object we're just going to be using it for the three that we can switch to the movies the titles and the actors uh, but i need to define them consistently here when we're actually defining the individual screens for a rating movie or actor i'm going to put the actual name of those up at the top of the screen. So we got uh, Movie Mania, let's say MPAA Ratings. And then this one's going to be Movies. This one's going to be Actors. And this one's going to be Rating. And this one's going to be Movie. And this one's going to be Actor. So now we've got those, I can actually use those inside of my screen definitions by saying title ID equals r dot string dot main. Kind of like that. And we're going to do the same kind of thing for each of these. So we go ratings. And there's a bunch of ways we can do this. If I didn't want to put these in the actual screen data, I would create a little wrapper object, kind of like I had for top actions. We call it maybe bottom action or bottom or screen info, which would take a screen and a title to go with it that we're passing in. Uh, but this, for this particular example, this works out pretty well. 
So we'll say movies and actors and rating movie and actor. There we go. So now that I've got that, I can actually use that when I'm creating this scaffold. So let's see, he was for label. So we're going to have icon equals some lambda. And then label, whoops, equals, oh, hit the right button, Scott. Kind of like that. So the icon is going to be, surprise, surprise, an icon. Um, but now, of course, we need an icon for each one of these ones. So similar type of thing with the screen, we can define icons inside of them. We'll come back to that. Uh, and then the content description is going to be that label again there. So content description is going to be string resource. Or, you know, actually, let's do this. Let's say val label text equals string resource screen dot title ID. That way I don't have to look it up more than once, which is kind of ideal. So instead of that, we're going to say label text. And then down here, we'll say text, text equals label text. Boom. So now we need to do something with these, these uh, image vectors. And there's a whole bunch of icons we can use in our application. There's a default set that comes with Compose that you can use, but it's fairly limited. Uh, there are multiple other icons that we can bring in as well. Let's take a look, first of all, the default set, and then we'll take a break. So if we go to our view model here and set this up so that we not only have a title, we also have a icon, which is going to be an image vector. And then we can pass those in for each one of these. Now let's take a look at the default icons here. If I say icons dot default, which just defaults to filled icons. You can change it to outlined icons if you want. Dot, and then there's several things here. Add, account, box, account, circle, add, circle, arrows, blah, 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 a whole bunch of stuff there. And nothing that looks like a movie or anything like that. So what would be nice is to have some kind of a, uh, something more detailed. The problem is when we bring in the more expanded icon set, it's huge. So what you can do is up front reference the entire icon set, but then once you decide on things, you're actually going to copy the code out for each one into your application. So let's take a look at the expanded icon set. Bring him down there. And we shall say... Um, yeah, I had some interesting searches. This down here, if you haven't seen Girls 5 Eva, it's a hilarious show. And there was a great line with Sarah Bareilles. Somebody asked her, it's like, you need to write a love song. She's like, I'm not going to write you a love song because you asked for it. And it, it just, she just flowed right off her mouth. And it's like, yeah, that's a great little meta reference. Um, but anyway, um, let's take a look at, uh, what was I looking for? Oh, uh, material icons expanded. Um, let's see if that helps. Uh, extended preview, is that... Ooh! Is that all of them? Nice, nice, nice. Um, I gotta find the actual dependency. I may have found something new that's, that's gonna help me. So you have Compose Material Icons, and Material Icons Extended is another one here. So let's see what this says. Let's just go to MVN Repository. And we can search for Material Icons Extended. And we're going to come down here. Let's see. Uh, let's pick the. Well, that's RC1. Let's just go ahead and have the 111 version. And then I'm going to go to Gradle here. 
and Gradle Short, actually, it's come there. I'm going to copy that, come back over to our, that's actually not the one I want, movies example. There we go. And let's come to our build.gradle in the app and paste him in there. Um, I think I need to put that as implementation to start with. So that's going to bring in our extended icons when I sync. Now it is pretty large, so you don't want to keep that in your application. But once we're done, we can go in and find the ones that we're interested in and just copy the source for them. Um, each of those icons is just a set of drawing instructions because they're vectors. So now if we come back here and do this, We should see quite a few more in here. And if I start to say movie, I think there's one for movie. There we go, for movie. Um, I'm going to go ahead and use that for my main screen icon. You came to this class to hear me hum. That was the only reason. Is that it? Okay. So let's take a look at some of these other ones here. So we have our main screen is going to be movie. Our rating screen, let's hold off on him for a minute. Movie screen will be movie. Actor screen. Um, is there one for person? Let's just say person. And then for movie screen, going to be movie. Actor screen is just going to be person as well. And now we got to deal with something for the rating screen. So here's where we're actually going to take a look to see if we find any interesting icons. So let's take a look in here and see if this is actually going to help. Material items extended preview. I'm going to put a nice little bookmark there in case this actually works out okay. But let's see if we can find something in here that might be, I don't think we're going to find anything that's interesting for rating. Um, let's see. <coughs> Pardon me, I had to cough. Um... Maybe stars. Let's look for stars. There's a star outline with a little checkbox next to it. That might be good enough. I don't know if this is actually... So you have star outline. Let's just see if star will work. Star rate. There we go. Let's try that one. See how that looks. And then rating screen. We'll go with star rate again. I mean, that's kind of a different concept because that stars tend to be how good is it as opposed to what it's rated. Eh. Let's take another quick peek and see if there's something else here we can put in place for that. Just something nice and simple. Um... Let me look for the word security. Nope. Material icons. Now there seems to be some overlap between this font set and that. So sometimes it's easy to find them in here. Security. I just want to get like a little guy shaking his finger or something. Now uh, let's do something, eh. local police. Let's use this uh, 911 emergency one. 
I think that looks good enough for now. I'm sure we could find some other icon or we could draw one ourselves or make it like PG-13, but let's use the little uh, 911 emergency, see if that shows up. Well, we'll just say emergency. Let's see if that shows up. And we'll come up here, emergency, and hopefully that'll work okay. So now we've got icons defined inside here. We should be able to actually use them. So I can say screen dot icon. Now, if you don't have one that you find inside there, you could actually import an SVG. I'm not going to go through a lot of detail on that. I just want to kind of point out where you do it. So if we went to source main res drawable, you could right click on this and say new vector asset. And then you could actually bring in an SVG file and most SVGs it'll be able to deal with. Um, if it's a super complex one, probably not. But if you have a simple SVG, it should work pretty well. That'll let you define a vector asset, which you can pass into here by saying drawable resource, I believe. Or resource drawable. I would have to look that up. But there's a, um, maybe it's vector resource. There's a function kind of similar to string resource where you can pull it in. I'd have to look it up, but that way you can pull in an explicit vector that you've defined for your project as opposed to using one of these uh, already defined ones. But for now, we'll use the already defined ones. <coughs> okay, so we have now, is it selected? We have an icon. We have a label for it. The icon also has the content description test uh, text and then the on click there. So we should be good for that. I don't think we need any of these other, need anything else inside there. So this will define our bottom navigation. When the user clicks on it, we should be able to switch screens that way. So let's see how that's going to work. Um, and what is he, oh, that was just because I had it clicked on there. So now we have a nice kind of movie scaffold we can use for each of our pages. And what I'd like to do is start off by defining these for the, the main screens. So let's take a look there. I'm going to go back to our main Java, main activity. And then inside there, we have each of our screens defined. We're going to go to each of these screens and put the scaffold in it. So let's go to the main screen first. And I'm going to say movie scaffold. We have a bunch of things passing in. So we're going to need to have a coroutine scope passed in. We need to have a title. Now, because we're in this main screen function, we know it's the main screen. So we can actually come in here and say r dot string dot, um, what was the, oops, why is he not bringing him in? Let's come up to the top. He's in a different package, that's the problem. So I'll bring him in like that. So say r string dot screen title main. <coughs> but movie scaffold needs a string, so we need to pull that out here. <coughs> Remember that we did that so that we can actually have a string that we build inside here, and which will be like the uh, title of a movie or something later on. So that'll give us our string resource. And then our top actions, um, on the main screen, we don't need anything. So I'm going to say empty list of, um, oh, I need an immutable list. Let's make an empty immutable list. Let's come back to common. And we'll say fun empty immutable list, which is going to be an Immutable list, T, just like that. I think it'll be, whoops, need to put that over here. And he needs a list being passed in, so we'll pass an empty list into him. There we go. And now we should be able to go back to our main screen and have empty immutable list. And that's good. There we go. 
So current screen, we need to know what the current screen is when we're on the main screen. And for the main screen, it really, we shouldn't have to pass that in, but I want to be consistent on it just so it's simple. So current screen is going to be a screen. And now for screen targets, it's going to be the same throughout the entire application. It's going to be the same three ones. So let me create a little helper for that. Let's go into our, maybe our view model where all the screens are defined up there. So let's have a val screen targets equals immutable list of, and what are going to be our possible screen targets on there? So we're going to have our rating screen, our movie screen, and our actor screen. So rating screen, movie screen, and actors screen. There we go. So that's going to be our common screen targets we're going to use everywhere. So I'm just going to define that once. And it's a mutable, uh, mutable list, so should be just fine with that. So we'll have screen targets. It's just going to pull him in there. Now on screen select is going to be doing something. Let's actually take a look at what we got here. So we get on screen select as a lambda and then the content goes inside there. So on screen select is going to have to have a function here passed in who's going to take a screen and be able to switch. So we'll pass him in there just like that. And now let's take the guts of this page And just paste it right in there and there we go so now we should have this use that common scaffold like everything else there uh, and what we're going to do is is set it up so that the call to this works okay and then we'll take a break so let's go back to the main activity and we'll see that now the main screen is a little unhappy because he has extra stuff he needs to pass in so we need the scope and did i find to find one inside here yeah, I passed one in, so I'm good there. <clears throat> what else is missing? Current screen and on screen select. So we'll have current screen equals, and then on screen select, and we need to have those passed in. Now the view model keeps track of the current screen, so I can say view model dot screen so that's my current screen um, but that's null now notice here I have view model screen and then in checking for null and then coming down into here by referencing screen again here because it's a property that could change in a different thread I don't have any guarantees based on the test up here so what I can do with my when is actually assign like this and then if I get to this spot, I know it's not null because it'll smart cast. So I can just go current screen there and kaboom. So this takes a point in time snapshot of which screen I'm currently looking at and then does the checks inside here. The little green highlight means it's smart casting. So at this point, if I look at current screen, he knows that um, the current screen was smart cast to just screen and not screen question mark. The actual type of him is screen question mark, meaning it's nullable. But the null takes care of it here. If I'm in this block, I know for sure it's main screen. And well, I could have just passed in main screen there because I have that information. But either way, I, mean, I could use the variable or I could just use main screen hard coded. Now on screen select, I'm going to have to do something in the view model to change that. So let's go back to our view model. And I have this push and pop. Let's do a select main screen uh, select uh, list I'll say select list screen there we go make up my mind and we're gonna take a screen and what I'm gonna do is say screen stack equals list of screen so I'm just gonna completely replace it with just that one so I've wiped out the whatever's on the list so far, on screen so far the list so far and I'm gonna replace it with that one current screen 
when that changes, it'll change this screen automatically because of the way I did this guy. And we should be in good shape. So here I'm going to say call view model, select list screen. Now remember that the lambda here, I could have called this kind of like this. If this entire lambda is just calling a function with it being passed in or with the exact arguments being passed in, you can use a function reference instead of an explicit lambda with the call. So it shortens up our syntax a little bit saying, I need a function that takes a screen. Here's a function that takes a screen. We'll just pass a reference to that function. So I can do that. Boom, there we go. So now we have that guy. Let's run this. Hopefully it will I think we're okay. We'll see what our initial screen looks like and it should look much, much better. We've changed a few more things. He has to think more. I still get the feeling that I don't have everything excluded from my virus scanner that I need excluded. And poof. So now we're getting something that actually looks quite a bit nicer. Yeah, I don't mind that for rating. That's not too bad. It's, I'm not sure how star is emergency, but... But you see now we have our title bar at the top there with Movie Mania. We have our screens at the bottom here, which is our switch. Let's see what happens if I click on Movies. Boom, I go to my Movies. If I go back, oops. Ah, because I only had the one thing on the stack, the back doesn't work. Um, so maybe I should do it as a push. Well, we'll have to think about it. I'm going to go ahead and take a break for 10 minutes. It's 6.29. I will start back up at 6.39. So let's do the same kind of thing for the other screens and see if we can switch them. And I think I'm just going to go ahead and switch it to do a push instead of actually completely switching the screen. Um, either that or we should add in some functionality to, to catch uh, uh, if they're getting out and then uh, ask them, do you really want to exit? Um, but let's just go ahead and switch it to say uh, in, uh, select list screen will just push it for now. So I'll say push screen, comment that out for the moment. And let's go and take care of these other guys. So the main screen had that scaffold. I'm just going to kind of copy the top part of that. Let's take a look at the movies screen. Let's see if we can do something similar. So we'll have a movie scaffold. Let's grab the stuff from the top here as well. So we need the scope, the current screen, and the on-screen select. And put the list screen up in there. <coughs> So the title of this screen is going to be Screen Title Movies. Not having any actions or anything yet. Current screen, screen targets, that all should be good there. Let's do the same kind of thing for the ratings screen. And we'll go to the actors screen while I've got that copied. And then back to the movies screen. Copy on the scaffold. That looks good. So ratings. We'll do the scaffold. Change this to the ratings title. And then actors. Same thing. And so we can get a lot of good common functionality just by calling these common functions like that. 
make that be actors as well. So now we should be good on those ones. Let's go ahead and try running that just to see if those are OK. Let's see what happened here. Ah, I didn't pass it. I didn't change the, the calling parameters on these guys. So we need main, current, and on screen select need to get added to each of these. And so which parameter is this one? So actors equals actors, kind of like that. And we'll need to do the same thing here. And then movies equals movies. And let's see, we had ratings, same type of thing. And now let's try it. In case we have our movie mania, we can go to the ratings, movies, actors. And if I go back, this is the only thing I didn't like about that is that now it's jumping between that way. Um, I think I'm going to keep it like I had it because we're eventually going to get rid of this main screen that I had. Um, so let's go back to the view model. I'm going to change that, get rid of that. And so now if we switch between these different screens, and then from any of those hit back, we should exit the application. So yeah, that's I think that's going to be the way I want to do it. And we'll get rid of that main screen. We're just going to need a way to, to set up the database. So we've got to figure out a place to put that. We'll come back to that in a little bit. For right now, I'm just going to leave it with that extra main screen. And let's see what we had one more time. So we get our database. We can go to our ratings, our movies, our actors. And then when we hit on the item in the list, it's actually going to display the details for that one. And why didn't it show me? That's interesting. So I go to movies and go to the transporter. He's showing me a blank list. That's odd. Well, we'll get that working again. Okay, so let's look at the individual movies screens. We're going to have a little bit nicer user interface we want to put on each of these screens for showing things. So we want to have the title to be at the top, be the actual title of the movie or the name of the, the um, actor or the name of the rating, that type of thing. So let's take a look at rating screen. And we're going to have this be... Uh, movie scaffold. So let me come into ratings here and just copy that movie scaffold. Now we can move that stuff inside there. <coughs> and we'll need to pass in a scope. Well, let me copy that from the other one here. There we go. And that data is there. We'll make this one, instead of the, the uh, title being this, we're going to actually have the title be the current movie, that or the current rating that's being displayed there. So I'm going to say ratings with movies dot rating dot name. And because it's possibly null, what we're going to want to do is set this guy up so that if we have a rating with movie, then we'll get the rating, then we'll get the name. But if we if that comes out to be null at any point, we're going to need a fallback here. So that's where we can say string resource r.string.rating, something like that. And we probably want to have a better fallback than this because if there's nothing there, there's probably a bigger problem. Maybe we want to display an error screen or something. But this should work well for now. <coughs> Okay, so we have our top actions. This is where we're going to want to actually allow somebody to edit things. We're going to want to add an edit action in this eventually. We'll come back to that. Screen targets are normal screen targets and everything. So now we want to actually take a look at what we're displaying here. Now, the uh, 
the idea here is that we had the rating at the top in the title and then the individual movies listed underneath. And we don't have any type of extra data. Or do we have a description? I think we had a description. Let's go ahead and put the description in here. But let's set it up so it looks more like a, a, a form that's describing things to us. So we can have a label and we can have some information and a label and information and so on. Now to do that, I want to create some common components to make this easier to deal with. <coughs> Pardon me. Let's come back to common. And right now I've got a simple button. Let's create a couple components for displaying text and a label. So we'll say at composable fun label. And we're going to need some text coming in there. And this, this is going to be something that's a little bit smaller than what's being displayed on the screen. So let's actually have, I think with this I want to use the, uh, the string resource because the labels are going to be fixed. And we'll say uh, string resource uh, label ID. It's going to be an integer. And then we can have this be a text where the text is string resource ID equals label ID. And let's have some styling on this as well. If we take a look at text, we'll see that he has a style parameter I can set up. And that I can pull right out of the theme. So that'll be a common function or a commonly defined styling for the entire application. <clears throat> so I can come in here and say style equals material theme dot typography dot some style that's defined. And uh, unfortunately, H1, H2, and things like that are huge by default. We can override them to make them smaller, but I'm just going to go ahead and pick the, I believe I used H5 and H6 for these guys. So I'm going to use an H6 for the label, so it's a little bit smaller, and an H5 for the actual displayed text. Now I also want to set up a modifier. So I have some padding by default. And that way I don't have to specify that padding every single time I create one of these texts. So there's a nice little label. Let's do a display for text. And this time it's actually going to be a string because we're probably going to have data for that most likely. And I'm going to change the typography to be an H5 so it comes up a little bit bigger. So there's just some nice little helpers that we can use there. <clears throat> Let's go back to our rating screen that we were defining. And inside here, I'm going to have label. And let's give it an r.string. We need to define him. Do I have strings up anywhere? Values, strings. Let's say label description. Something like that. And then I can go back to my rating screen and I can say label description. And then I want the display of the actual value. So the text is going to be rating with movies dot rating description. Otherwise, just empty. We won't have anything there at all. And then we're going to display this list of things to choose from. And we're going to work with lists next week to do something much prettier. So now I'm just going to leave it like this. I will just change this, though, to be display. So we don't have to have um, any type of uh, extra modifier. But notice here that now it won't let me pass modifier. And I need to make this thing clickable. Uh, so what I'm going to do with the display is I'm going to allow us to pass in a modifier. And by convention, the modifier should be the last argument before the last lambda. So if you wanted to have the last lambda like be content or something like that, you want that to be the last parameter in the, uh, the composable function. So you can push it outside of the parentheses, just kind of a Kotlin convention there. Uh, modifier should be the last normal parameter before that. So now that we have a modifier coming in, instead of creating a brand new modifier, we're just going to extend the modifier that was passed in, kind of like that. And we can do the same thing on the label up there if we wanted to. 
and then down here, pass him in. And so now on our rating screen, we can pass in that modifier, which lets, makes the whole thing clickable, and then add some padding so that uh, it, it's spaced out a little bit better. Similar with display up here. Now you'll notice now, no value pass for modifier. And what if I don't need a modifier? Well, in this case, I should pass in a default for it. So we'll just say, start off with plain old modifier. And he's up here as well. So if I don't specify it, then I'm just starting off with an empty modifier, and that's perfectly fine. So there we go. That should update our rating screen there, make him a little bit nicer to look at. Let's take a look and see if that'll work. And let's see. Oh, the data being passed in doesn't match. So rating screen, I need scope current screen and on select. So we'll come back to our main activity. And we're going to need to grab those. And what's the name of this guy? Oops. Rating with movies. There we go. Let's try that again. And we will go to our ratings, click on a rating. And now notice that PG-13 is the top. And then we have description unsuitable for those under 13. And then the list of the movies. Let's make that a little bit nicer. So one thing I want to do is indent that description a little bit and then put a little label above here to say movies with that rating. So we're gonna come into here and I wanna tweak display to have that indentation all the time. So overall, I've got eight DP padding, but I'd like to add in some extra padding at the start. Now I can do that a couple ways. I can pass in individual parameters for the padding. So I could say the padding at the start, the padding at the end, the padding at the top and the bottom, um, but I can chain these as well. So I could say after I give eight padding everywhere, I can have extra padding at the start. And let's say that I want to just throw in an extra eight DP. So now if I run this, and go to ratings, go to PG-13, notice how it's indented now. And now all these guys are indented as well because they're displays. Um, but I want to have another, let me actually indent that a little bit more, just to make it a little more obvious. Um, but now what I also want to do is put a little label above this to say movies with that rating. <clears throat> so let's have a, let's go to strings. And let's say label movies with rating. Well, let's say movies with uh, percent one S, I believe is the right syntax on that. Movies rated, let's do that. Movies rated, blah, blah, blah. So we can actually pass in an argument there as well. I think I got that the right order. I usually have to look that up, but we'll try it out and see how it goes. So I'm gonna put another label here and we'll say label movies with rating, and now we can actually just pass that rating in there. So it's rating with movies, rating uh, description, or oops, rating name, that's what we wanted there. And I'm just gonna use blank there. Whoops. Oh, I see. So we're actually, now this is one of those cases where we have a little bit of problem passing in just the ID. Um, if we wanted to have parameters that could fill in, we're going to have to add in extra parameters to the function to do that. Or we could just change this to require you to do the string expansion. Um, or we could have an alternate version of it. So we could come up here. Let's do this. 
So I'm going to have label, which is going to be a string. Just do that. And then we can change this guy <coughs> to be label, passing in label equals string resource, label ID, and modifier equals modifier. Whoops. And then just get rid of that like that. So we're just going to use this base function, which takes an actual string, which allows us to pass in a string if we want. Or we can use this one, which passes in the ID and expands it for us. So now if I come back here, I can say label equals string resource, bloop, bloop, and that should be okay now. And let's try that out and see if I got lucky on my specification. And then we go to our ratings, we'll click on our PG-13, and boom. So now we have description, blah, 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 movies rated that, blah, blah, blah. And if we click on one of these guys, it's now going to go to that specific movie. So excellent. So this looks a little bit nicer there as far as formatting it. And we can also switch over to the different lists here to get stuff. And we can make these a little bit nicer later, but that's going to be for next week. So, so far, so good. So let's do the same kind of thing for the movie and for the actors so that they'll look a little nice. And you'll notice that the great thing about this is it's really not that much code. And if you define your own composable functions for some common helpers like this, it can really significantly reduce your code and make things a little bit simpler to do. Um, we could have done something similar here to have another function that just passes in arguments, uh, an ar a varying length argument list, and then does this behind the scenes. Um, but eh, I don't know. Let's go to the strings and put a couple more of these guys in and we're going to say movies with actor so let's say movies starring that actor and this will be actors with movie actors in movie how about that and we'll say um, cast of the movie. Let's change the text so it looks kind of like that. Cast of movie. And we'll make that be movie starring actor. They don't really have to match because you know obviously this label is gonna you're gonna change the text for whatever language you're dealing with. So we got those set up. Let's go to our rating screen and take a look at what he looked like. I'm going to grab that movie scaffold and let's go to the movie screen. Oops. No, I don't want sticky keys. I hit the wrong button there. And we're going to need to pass those in. Let's grab those first couple things. Come back to the movie screen. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Um, I pulled the wrong thing. Let's go back to the rating screen. I wanted to go up here. Grab those three. So we'll pass those in. And then this is going to become movie with roles, passing in the movie, and then title. Otherwise, we'll just go ahead and say screen title movie. Kind of like that. And then we have our stuff inside here, which we'll tweak in a second to make it look nicer. And let's see what we got. So we're going to put the, the movie title we've already got up there. We do want the movie description now, though. So we'll say label, label ID is r.string.description, 
And then we're going to have display. The text is going to be the title of the movie or nothing. And then we want to have another label down here for, what did I call that? Cast of movie. Um, and that guy, we're going to say label equals string resource. Bloop, oops. And we want the movie title in there again. And did I miss a parenthesis? Yes, I did. There we go. And then we're going to print all these movies out. Um, but we want the movies to be done with display. So they'll be bigger and they'll have some indentation on them as well. And there we go. And we can really should be doing something like that. We'll, we'll take a look at that later. Um, let's go ahead and see how that looks. And oops, again, I forgot to pass in the extra stuff here. So those guys. And then what's the movie with roles? There we go. Let's try that. And I can now go to movies, go into a movie, and it says movie blank, description blank. Hmm. So something, let's try going into this guy and going into the transporter. So from there that worked, but it looked like going from the movies list for some reason wasn't working. We'll have to find that out. But now if I go to Jason Statham, it looks like his data is there. But for some reason when I go to movies and choose a movie, well, now that's working. That's interesting. Let's try a different movie. So it's not actually switching. Something's not switching the movie, the selected movie, when I go from the movies list to the actors list. Yeah, so I picked the I picked the rock there, and that's, that's wrong. So let's take a look at our movies list real quick and see what might be going on here. So we have that guy here. So select on screen select, select that. Otherwise, we're going to push the movie screen. Um, oh, we didn't select the movie, huh? Why was that commented out? Let's try that. So I go to the movie and pick on this. Go back to the movies, pick on transporter. Okay, that's okay. Why did I have that uncommented? That's weird. How about the actors? So the actor's screen doesn't seem to be doing the right thing. Oh, because I'm pushing movie screen here. Let's try that. It helps when you don't have bugs in your code. That's still not working. So the actor screen, did I even, maybe I just didn't even define anything in there. No. Well, we'll find out shortly what the problem is there because we're going to do the actor screen next. So we're going to go to the movie screen and let me copy the stuff from the top here. Go back to the actor screen. We'll do the same thing there. And then back in the movie screen, let's grab the scaffold. We'll go back to the actor screen. Put in that scaffold there. And let's grab that and change this to be actor. There we go. That all looks good. And so now we can define our little column with our information. And let's clean this up a little bit. So we already have that actor there. I don't think actor had anything else in it as far as description or something. So let's take a look. Actor. 
he just had ID and name. So the name is the only thing there. Uh, we don't need to put an extra label in there for description because they don't have a description. So let's come back to here. There's our actor screen. And I don't need that. But I do need some kind of a label here to say what they star in. So I'm going to say label, label equals string resource r dot string dot uh, let's see it was starring there label movie starring actor there we go and we want to have the actor being passed in so we're going to have actor with roles actor name there we go and then this will be all of these guys, which we're going to change to display. And now for lucky, this should be good. Let's try it out and see what happens. Once again, I forgot every single time I forget to modify the base. So let's come in here and let's see what the parameter name is for him. Actor with roles. And let's try that now. We'll go to actors and we'll pick an actor. So that's coming up blank still. So let's see why that's going on. Where's my actors screen? Oh, same type of thing. I could have sworn I had that unchecked. I don't know why I had that commented out. That's interesting. It must have been, I'll have to go back and look at the video from last week. There we go. And then the movie starring her, going to Transporter 2. That's not going anywhere. Let's take a look at Transporter 2 here. That'll looks good. Amber Valletta, Transporter 2. For, so for some reason, that is not doing the actual action. So let's look at actor screen. I probably have it commented out again or something. So actor screen, we're getting the movie passed in. Oh, we're, because we're pushing it to the actor screen. That should be movie screen. Somebody should have called me out on these last week. I was making a lot of mistakes. Okay, actors, Amber Valletta, ta-da, transporter two, ta-da. So now we're getting something that actually is looking a little nicer here. And it really wasn't a lot of work to get this, this working nicely. So let's see, so we have a rating, rating detail, movie detail, actor detail. So much, much nicer. So the next thing I want to try to do is let us edit some of these. So we're going to try that and see if we can actually make that work. It's going to be a little bit more work to have that happen. But let's see what happens. Uh, and I think what I'm going to do here, just in case, let's go up to VCS up here. I'm going to say en enable version control integration. I'm going to pick Git. And I'm going to go to commit here. And I'm just going to commit the stuff locally. I'm not going to put it anywhere else. I just want to make sure that I have a snapshot of what I've got, just in case I bork things up. That's in bork, bork, bork. Okay, so uh, I'll say work in progress, commit. And it's going to analyze the code and be very unhappy on something, I'm sure. But I'm going to say commit. It's not too bad. Three warnings and one to do. I'm just going to commit anyway. There we go. So that gives us a nice little snapshot just in case anything happens, and then I can back that out. So what I want to do now is have some input fields. So I'm going to have a label and an input field now. And there's really a couple ways you can do that. You can have a, a, a text field that has a border that has the label built into it. Or we can do something kind of similar to what I've just been doing by putting the uh, a separate label and the separate text. I'm going to go ahead and do the outline text field with a built-in label, just so you can see what that looks like. If you don't use the built-in label, then you could use separate labels outside of it. So let's go back to our common stuff. And what I'd like to do in here is to find a new composable. I'm going to call it 
text field and have some stuff passed in there. <clears throat> and inside here, I can just say equals outlined text field. And we'll do that guy there. Sounds pretty good. And he's a pretty simple guy to start with. The first thing we need is which value to currently display in this text field. And the next thing we need is what to do when the user changes the value. Generally, the simplest thing here to do is pass in that value and pass in a function to do on value changed. The question becomes, do you need some kind of validation? Because what I'm going to do here is anytime the value changed, I'm going to update the data in the database. I don't want to have to wait for the database update to change to come through and actually display the data on the screen because otherwise you can get some really weird effects. We're going to try it that way and see what happens, but quite often what happens is you, when you type too fast, the cursor gets into a weird spot. So we usually need to have some intermediate value to hold on to the data um, and it still send the updates to update the database, but don't wait for the database result to actually update us. So what I'm going to do here is let's pass the value in. So we're going to have value, which is going to be a string coming in. And then we're going to have on value change, which is going to say, here's the new value. And I will do something with it, but I, whoops, but I won't be uh, expecting a return value. So the value coming in is going to be value. On value change is going to be on value change. And that gives us a nice simple outline text field to start with. But I want to take this a little farther too. Let's also put in a modifier with some padding and stuff. I'm going to bring him down there. Uh, and I'll let us specify the modifier coming in in case we need to. This one I'm not going to indent because I'm not going to have any labels on the screen. So I don't really need to have the indentation to kind of set it off more. So I'm just going to go with the uh, modifier.8dp. So that should give us a really basic text field there. Uh, let's see, anything else I need? This I want to put the label on this one as well. So let's take a look at what he has. And we'll see that there's a label slot being passed in, which is a composable. And there's also a placeholder, which you can put in some you know, description of the t what you want the user to do here. Uh, so we can put in both of those. Let's first of all put in label equals bloop, and placeholder. Kind of like that. I think that's right. Yeah, placeholder was all lowercase. And so label is just going to be some text we're going to display there. And we're going to say, let's pass the label in here as well. Let's say label ID, which is going to be an int. And we're going to force it to be a string res. Whoops. And so this one's going to say text equals, whoops, string resource, label ID, and that should be good. And the outline text field is going to take care of the styling on that. It's going to set it up so it'll be actually be smaller when it appears. So that should be good. Uh, placeholder is going to be text that appears in the field. So let's uh, pass that in as well. Let's do a, we'll do it as a string res as well. We'll say placeholder ID. And then we can do that. Kind of like that. And that should give us a pretty decent little text field to start with. Uh, we're going to rely on the database change to actually uh, uh, update. Um, we'll have to see how this thing works. So we've got him. We're going to want to replace that on an edit screen. So that means we need some edit screens. Let's go ahead and create a movie edit screen here. So I'm going to take a copy of the movie screen. I'm going to call it movie edit screen. I'm going to add that. It's going to be a movie edit screen. We need our cope, uh, scope, current screen, screen select. Now, there's a couple ways we can deal with this. We could make this a dialogue instead of a screen. So the user has to deal with it and has to say okay or cancel to do the edits. 
Um, that's one approach. I tend to like to just let the user edit the data in place. The problem here is that when we do the um, the movie scaffold here with these screen targets, they can click out of the screen to just jump back. Well, I guess that's okay because uh, if we're actually saving the edits on the fly, we're in good shape with this. So we have our movie edit screen, have our scaffold, have the movie title at the top. Assuming that the movie actually changes, we'll see that title change as you type the title change as well. And let's see, so current screen, screen targets on screen select. That all looks pretty good. So what we're going to have here is a column of things we can edit. So you're going to be able to edit the title, you're going to be able to edit the display. So I'm going to say text field and I'm going to pass all of these wonderful things in here. So the label ID for the text field is going to be the, uh, what do we call it? r.string See if I can actually type right now. R dot string dot label. Did I have one for the title? I don't have one for the title yet. So let's go to there. Because we didn't need a label for the title before. It was just in the, the uh, toolbar at the top. So we're going to go with label title up at the top there. Now we want to send a placeholder here that says like uh, enter movie title. So we'll come back to here and let's say placeholder movie title. We'll say enter movie title. So if they blank it out, it'll actually prompt them what that field is for r.string dot placeholder movie title that sounds good and then the value that we actually want to display so we're going to go with this guy or an empty string and then what to do when the value changes now there's a couple ways we can approach this we could have individual functions for each type of thing that changes here so we could have a, a, a change for the movie title, for the movie description, and so on. That's a little overkill in passing all these functions in. What we really can do is if we have this movie, we can actually modify him in place. Let's see what type he is. So he's a data class, and a data class has a copy function that allows us to change a single field inside of there. So we could, well, actually let's see what movie is. Movie is this guy. He's a data class as well. So we can change individual fields in him. Let's go ahead and do that. So in here, we're going to have on, whoops, on movie change. And it's going to be the entire object changing. There we go. And he's going to take a movie changing, and he's going to do something with it. Why do I keep saying until? There we go. So now inside here, we're going to say, whenever the text inside that changes, I'm going to call on movie change, passing in that movie. But if there is no movie, I don't want to do anything. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to say that dot let only do this if we actually have a movie, which should be the case. We should never have that. Oh, I just want to do require movie. Yeah, this screen should never be never be displayed if there isn't a movie. So let me try this. Require movie with roles. And then require movie with dot roles dot movie. That's actually probably going to be a better way to do this. And what the require will do is throw an exception if those aren't true. But what's really neat about this require not null is that he sets up this contract and he says that if I return, I'm implying the value is not null. 
which then the Kotlin compiler can use as some extra information to deal with a smart cast. So once I get past these, he knows both of those are not null, and we'll see that the smart casts now work for us. Actually, I don't. Do I need that second one? Actually, I don't need that one because the move. If we have a movie with roles, movie is definitely not null. So that's a little nicer there. And I can just get rid of all those question marks. Only do this when you know for sure something's going to work. Um, in this particular case, you know, we should never have this thing called if we have an empty movie with roles. Um, and now we can actually get rid of that. And that. And now we don't need that. We can just go with on movie change. Passing in movie. Uh, oops, movie with roles dot movie dot copy changing the title so I can say title equals it so whatever that string was that changed there boom and then we can do something similar with the other values here so let's put in the other text fields we want so we have the title we have the description and let's come back here and say enter a movie description Enter a description for the movie. And we'll say movie description. And what else did I have in the movie in the movie there? Title description and rating ID. So just the title and description are the only two editable fields we're going to deal with here. And so this one we're going to change the description to be it. So we're going to create a brand new copy of the movie with all the existing data, just changing the description each time. And this one we're going to be description. And now we'll get rid of the rest of this stuff. Eventually we're probably going to want the, the roles listed. Well, we can edit the roles separately. There's so many different things we could do with the user interface on this. So let's see. So that should a column with the two text fields. We don't need selecting the individual things anymore. And now we just need to set this guy up so that we can actually call him. What's he complaining about here? Packages not match. Whoops, did I put that in the wrong spot? Or did I not change these ones? Maybe I missed one. Yeah, I missed the movie screen one. And let's see. That one I got. That one I got. That one I got. So I just missed that one, unfortunately. Okay, and let's go back to main activity. And we're going to need to, actually in the view model, We've got the movie screen, but we need a movie edit screen now. And I'm just going to put in there movie edit. Not that that's ever going to show up. And we'll still have that same icon in there. That's fine. Um, so for the movie edit screen, if we get that, we need to supply what to do in the main activity. So this when is no longer exhaustive. So we have the movie screen. Let's create our movie edit screen down here. There we go. And movie with roles, that all looks good. Wasn't there a parameter that I deleted from that? Oh, because we have on movie change instead of on select. So the lambda means something different. This is actually going to be the movie was changed. And so what here we're going to do is we don't need to select anything. 
it's going to be update the movie. So let's create an update function inside here. Fun update movie movie. We have to figure out what we're going to do with this. Now, this is going to hit the database. So we need to have this done off of the main threads. It's going to need to be a suspend function. And we're going to need to change that here to be a suspend function. And so now inside here, we can say scope.launch. Around him. And that should be pretty good there. Now, one thing we're going to want to think about with this, and we can talk about it in a later session, is that if the user is typing faster than the database is actually getting updated, there is a chance that the order that these are run in is going to be a problem. Because by saying scope launch, we're going to be kicking these, th these things off as separate coroutines, but that doesn't guarantee anything about the order in which they're run. So we're going to have to think about that and be careful about that a little bit later. Um, a good solution for that is to usually debounce these. So that means that as the user is typing things in, we'll cancel any changes that are in progress and then do the, the latest change. Uh, so we can talk about that in another session. But it's something to be a little bit aware of here. Um, if they type super, super fast, there is a chance that things are going to get messed up here. So that should change that. Let's go back to the movie. So this update function, we're going to say equals with context. Well, we're going to we're going to use the repository to do that. So let's get rid of the equals. We'll say repository dot update. Did I not put the movies in there yet for updating? Let's take a look at the repository. So we just have expand. So we don't have any type of update yet. Let's put an update for movie movie and now we can go to the movie database repository we'll override update and he's going to go db dot dow dot update movie boom just kind of like that so now our view model is going to try to update that movie if we go to our repository in the movie database, we're going to do the same kind of with context to ensure that this is going to be run on the I.O. dispatcher. There we go. Now there is going to be a problem here. The problem is going to be the way that we're fetching the individual movie with the ratings. When we call expand, this is run in the background and then sets this value once. So we're not refetching it after each one of these changes. That's going to be a bit of an issue. If we set it up to return a flow, it'll automatically return it each time. But we're not refetching it here. And so that could be a bit of an issue with the data. We'll have to talk about that in the next session. So if we go back, let's see. So we have the movie view model is calling him. The repository is set up. We have the right data in the DAO. So that should update the movie. And what we should see is as we're changing things, we're probably not going to see it change in that screen. But if we go back out to the, uh, the what you call it, the list of the movies, we'll see the, the updated uh, name. But we should probably only see one character ever change. Uh, let's take a look and see how it looks. But I'm pretty sure we're only actually going to see a single character change. Let's go to our main, make sure we're passing things in right. We have our scope launch calling update. That's good. There's our movie screen. Um, we need to be able to get to this movie edit screen now. So on our movie screen, we need to have him define an icon at the top of the screen as an action to go and do that edit. So inside him, instead of having an empty immutable list here, we're going to have an immutable list of and then pass inside of here a top action. And then he is going to have an icon and a content description ID and an on click. So we're going to say icon equals icons dot default dot edit. And then 
content description equals r dot string dot uh, I don't have it defined yet. Let's just double check. What did I have there? So content description ID. Why did I say icons? There we go. Let's go ahead and define this guy. And do I have anything there that looks like it might be? Nope. So let's say action description edit movie. Now we can go back over here and action description edit movie. And then we need a lambda there to actually do the action. So what is all the problem here? So we need an immutable act, uh, immutable list of top action found immutable list of screen. Oh, well, that's interesting. <laughs> I hardwired screens there. That's kind of a silly thing to do. Let's make this generic. Items. T. I'll make that be items. Now we should be a little happier there. That's better. So we're defining our top action with an icon, content description ID, and some action. So the action here is we're going to need to switch over to the other screen. So we're going to need to push on him. On, did I define it as push in the other screens? Let's take a look. I said select. Let's actually call it edit. So on edit. which is going to be take a movie and unit. So we'll say on edit, passing in that guy. And I'm going to do the same kind of thing I did with the require before. So I'm going to say require not null him. And then I can get rid of these guys. You have no idea how much I love this language. Being able to have the null safety like this is just fantastic. Um, did I miss any anywhere? Oh, I now have these that I don't need. And then uh, down here. And I have one more somewhere. There he is. Don't need that anymore. So much cleaner. Okay, so now we're good there. And we can call on edit. The calling screen is going to have to say it needs to do a switch over to the edit. So we'll go to main activity. And this guy is going to say on edit is going to be view model push movie edit screen. And I believe, let's see, what's going on over here? Ah, wait. Select and then edit. I switched them around. Let's just say on select explicitly. Oh, it just says select. Okay. There we go. Okay. Let's see what happens. Now, it's not going to quite work right. We'll get it working more next week. And then we'll talk about lists as well. Let's go to a movie, pick it, and notice that we now have this edit icon up there. Nice. When I click edit, boom. And here we go. We have some really nice little text fields. Now, I didn't expand these to fill the width, so I probably should just tweak that real quick. And then we can try editing it and see how badly that goes. So modifiers padding. And let's say 
fill max width like that. That'll look a little bit better. But it looks pretty good so far. So go to our movies, transporter two, edit, boom. Now let's see what happens when we start typing. I'm going to type, start typing something. We're not seeing anything show up there because we're not getting any feedback from the database update. But let me type A a few times here so that A is the last thing I type. And if we come out of here, oh, well, we saw all those updates. That's nice. It actually, well, not nice, it's gross, uh, but now if I come in, we'll see that it fetched that full with all the garbage that I typed, because I typed a whole bunch of garbage in there. Uh, so each edit is actually updating the data in the database. That's interesting that it's... I'm a little confused as to why it's actually got the full value, uh, but we'll take a look at it in detail next week, because I'm thinking... I had a value coming in. Oh, oh. So the reason that this is is having that full set of data is because movie itself is mutable. And so it's actually being able to keep track of those changes. And that's something that we need to fix uh, by using DTOs. Um, but so next week we'll take a look at this and we'll clean that up. But I mean, I, th I think it actually is coming up pretty decently. When I go in there to edit it, we can see all that. You can't see anything changing other than my cursor position here, which is bad. So we need to have some way to store the, the text locally and to make sure that that actually gets updated. So we'll see the change here as well as up here at the top. So we'll look at that at the beginning of next class, and then we'll put in our lists, and then life will be peachy. But I think it's actually starting to look a little bit nicer here with Jason Statham kicking a bunch of guys in the face. Okay. I will see you all next week. There is no other assignment. The current assignment is due next week.